Hey friends, welcome back to yet another Field and Garden podcast. And I really thank you for dropping in. I know that you have a lot of choices of what you listen to and, you know, makes my heart beat y'all knowing how many of you all are listening to what we have to offer. And I am joined again here today with good friend, Dave Dowling. Hey, Dave. Hi, Lisa. How are you doing today? I am really, really good. And it's so always so good to have you on because I will be really, really honest that I always learn a lot or at least something about everything that we talk about, Dave. And I just feel like you are just such a gift to this industry. And I now understand why the ASCFG has a Dave Dowling scholarship. You know, I mean, your gift of sharing information and the depth of your information is pretty um, dadgum amazing. And so I thank you for joining me here today. So friends, if you're new here with us, um, uh, my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler and I am the head bottle washer at the gardenersworkshop.com. What started out as a small middle of the city urban flower farm over like two decades ago has grown into so much more. And you can see it all over on our website. We um, have tons of resources, a blog, a podcast, tons of videos, Um, Just a lot of great information, an online garden shop, as well as our online courses are hosted over there for both home gardeners and for flower farmers, and even for folks that are want to be a part of the local flower scene, but maybe they don't want to be growers. Maybe they want to be a florist that only uses local flowers, and that is the up and coming industry that I see. I mean, florists have to really make themselves stand apart in the industry today. And y'all, there is no better way than with fresher, more gorgeous, more beautiful flowers with a story. And that's what you get from local flowers. And you can check out on our website, Ellen Frost actually teaches a course. I'm going to try to get this right, y'all, because I did not look at this. I mean, this was impromptu. Um, It's Florist School Online, Growing Your Business with Local Flower Sourcing. Ellen is a flower, a floor, um, what is she? She is a floral studio, a design studio in Baltimore, Maryland, that only sources flowers grown within a hundred miles. Y'all, that's in Maryland, like Baltimore, where winters are very cold. She does it year round. Um, You have to go over and check it out if that interests you. And if you are a flower farmer, you need to know the other side of the story to serve your florist better. And I'll just end this little infomercial right now. Um, I am like feeling like the future of the domestic flower industry is you know, using local flowers and growing local flowers as we take this industry back. And today, Dave is here because we are going to talk about the top five perennial mistakes that flower farmers make. And I would certainly think it could even apply to home gardeners. So Dave, you know, let's just talk about this. And I feel like this is one of these talks that I'm going to learn a lot because because I don't grow a lot of perennials, because I am, I'm a small farm in the middle of the city, I fight Bermuda grass, which is a very aggressive perennial weed, um, which is just, I mean, enough to make you want to quit farming. Um, So I have steered away from perennials. And so I'm kind of like this annual grower because I felt like I get the biggest bang for my buck. And I'm willing to listen to you try to convince me that maybe I need to add some. So What's the story? First off, define what a perennial is. Well, a perennial is any plant that you plant it this year and it's going to come back next year and for several years. Some perennials are not long lived. Some are like a peony is going to last you for decades. Um, some other perennials that if you're going to pick and all, picking them every year, you may kill them off after four or five years and have to replant them. But a perennial is any plant that basically a herbaceous perennial where the plant grows in the spring, flowers, then dies in the fall and grows back to root again the following year. So it kind of like disappears for winter. Correct. (laughs) Excuse me. All right. So the things that pop into my mind, which we're going to talk about during the five, I'm sure, is they take up year-round real estate. Yes. So if you don't have a lot of space, Mm -hmm. perennials might not be my go-to getting started kind of crop, but we both agree that peonies 
definitely qualify to be even for small growers to have a small patch, right? Everybody needs yeah. at least 25. Pe peonies are my number one perennial. When you start to plant perennials, start with your peonies first because they take a few years to get established. And nothing's worse than a, a new flower farm starting out and they wait four or five years to plant their first peony because <clears throat> you lost four or five years worth of income. So if that's your number one peony to plant, number one perennial to plant first is a peony. Yes. And, you know, because there is nothing that'll swell up a stand in order with a commercial customer than when you get to say, oh, and by the way, we have peonies this week. Um, and y'all, I mean, they can command, I'm just going to say it, Dave, they can command anywhere from three to eight dollars a stem wholesale, depending on the time of the year. Right. And yes. Yep. It's crazy. The prices that peonies are nowadays. So, yeah, definitely worth it. So, OK, so let's start off with um the top five perennial mistakes that people make. Now he's given me the headliner of each one. So I'm going to kind of guide him along. The number one is not having weed management on your mind and on your calendar. On your farm. Right. Weeds are the worst thing of any farm, annuals, perennials, or anything, whether you're growing corn or tomatoes or flowers. Um, they're expensive to manage. And weeds are always better to prevent rather than to deal with them. So in other words, if you have a field of perennials, it's better to keep it from ever having weeds than have to go in every year or two or three times a, a year and manually move the, remove those weeds by hand. Because um, there, if you're using chemicals, there is no weed killer that's not going to kill a perennial. So in other words, you can't go in and spread a, you know, they have a weed preventer for lawns, but that does not work on perennials because the perennials are basically weeds, you know, that- right. So you can't do it chemically, you have to do it by hand. So it's better to prevent them than to have to go back at, you know, later year after year and remove those weeds by hand. So, and so what is your method of madness for doing that? That's landscape cloth or a serious mulching program and permanent beds, right? Right, it depends on the type, the way the plant grows. Something like a peony or a baptisia stays as a clump where the, the stems always can come from about the same area, it doesn't creep. But if you get something like a mint or mountain mint or uh, some yeah. monardus, they spread by rhizomes and you've got this plant you planted this year and all of a sudden in three years, you got this patch that's a three foot circle. So you couldn't have put landscape fabric down there the hole in the middle for the plant because it would end up pushing the fabric up all around it. So you first you have to know how that plant's gonna grow, whether it's clump forming or spreading. If it's clump forming, you can use the landscape fabric and you would, um, like we mentioned before, the peonies, you cut an X in the fabric, don't burn or cut a big whole circle. So then you just have the circle to weed every year. You cut that X and the flaps go back down and the perennial will push up through it. You still have to weed that hole a little bit every year, um, but nothing like trying to weed the whole field or the whole aisle on the bed. You know, I remember so well, one of my very first visits, I think to your farm, golly day, it was a long time ago. There was like this enormous patch of mountain mint behind one of your greenhouses. Yes. <clears throat> and I mean, what a gift <laughs> because I mean, it's instant filler, right? And right. yes, yeah, so that's, but so, so that's that was one. not, no fabric, just right. bare ground. That you do have to weed for the first year or two. It's same with the um, gooseneck blue stripe. It spreads yes. the same way. Um, but after two or three years, it gets such a dense mat of plants. You get very few weeds in it. If you live to that point, the reward mm. comes. Oh, yes. Yeah, for sure. All right. Number two, and I think we can talk about this one for the rest of the day, wrong plant, wrong place. Yes, nothing's worse than seeing them still be out in the middle of a field just cooking and burning every year or a peony growing in the shade that puts up a few scraggly stems of leaves and never flowers. If it's a full sun plant, it has to be in full sun. If it's a full shade plant, it's got to be in full shade. If it can be part shade, then you can put it in between. Um, but definitely, the, it's got to be in the right location. Um, you know, there's most perennials are full shade and there's a handful of cut flower perennials that are shade. Things like polygonatum, the Solomon seal, a still be bleeding hellebores. Heart. Hellebores do much better in the shade. Yep. And so, you know, what this says to me, it is so hard to be a flower farmer about some of the choices you have to make. You have to put aside what you have just seen and fell in love with on somebody's farm, you have to look at your conditions, right? And 
evaluate, all right, I got a, you know, wet spot that's shaded after a 12 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, that's not where you're going to put your peonies. Right. You know, you just, because don't you think, is it not true that there's something to grow everywhere? Most. No matter where you have in your, in your field, you, there's something that will grow there. <clears throat> but sometimes you have to just say, okay, I can't grow that on my farm. No different than somebody in Southern California, you can't grow peonies. You just can't do it. Um, or somebody up in, um, you know, Canada can't grow birds of paradise. I mean, there's just certain things you can't grow where you're at. Right. So you got to grow what grows in your zone and then put it in the right spot on your farm as far as sun exposure. Because I mean, is that not like the pathway to the bottom line of profit? If you spend money, time, morale, weed labor, trying to do CPR on a crop that you simply just put in the wrong blooming spot. I mean, it's the hardest lesson to learn. I have this great saying that I love to say is like, and this is so perfect perennials. I love the saying. <laughs> cling to a mistake that you spent a long time making. If you have some perennial on your farm that is just not doing it, you either dig it up and move it, right? Relocate it to different conditions right. or <laughs> dig it up and give it away throw it away, sell it, yes. whatever. Yeah, um, if it's just not, if it's struggling where you haven't planted and it's because it's the wrong location, relocate it. But if it's struggling just because you have the wrong climate for it, give up. You know, you're not going to grow tool, you're not going to grow daffodils in Georgia, in Florida. It's just not going to work. So right. plant the plant that's for your zone, but then plant the right place on your farm with the right sun exposure. It's kind of like embrace what you got, people. Make lemonade yes. out of lemons, right? And um, for me, it's like people, I think, especially when they first get started, they just still don't get how much, how consumed you are with so much day-to-day -day stuff that you, you really have to take advantage of these kinds of decisions because they will pay off so much in the long run. And this is not a perennial mistake. It's a woody mistake. But don't you find that this is really true for hydrangeas too? Um, if, you know, if you're in the South, we have to give them some kind of shade. I mean, you, I remember right. you had shade cloth on yours up in Maryland. Right. P P uh, hydrangeas can't be out in the hot sun in the South. They'll just get burned. There's no way you're going to do it. So you grow them under shade cloth. Or so you can the, make your own shade if you don't you have. You can make your own I shade, yes. shade. You had to yeah, make you can make your own shade. Lots of places make their own shade with the shade structure. So that is an option. I just wanted to say that because it's probably, I get so many questions about people with burnt up hydrangeas um, before they can even really get started. The heat just takes them out. All right. Number three is the wrong variety. Yes. Um, when you're ordering or buying your product, whether it's bulbs or perennials, even woodies, make sure you're buying one that's tall enough for cut flowers. Um, you can look in the catalog and see all these beautiful flocks and they show a close up of the picture. It's a beautiful flower, but then you look at the description, it grows to be 12 inches tall. You don't want to, you don't want to buy that. You don't want to grow that as a cut flower because it's not tall enough. The next page might be the similar looking flower that's 34 inches tall. That's the one you want to grow as a cut flower. Um, I know somebody one time planted a bunch of um, uh, shrubs that were a dwarf variety, grew 12 inches tall, and she couldn't figure out why they didn't get tall. And I looked at the label, and I well, it says right on a dwarf. You know, they just bought a bunch of uh, woodies that was the dwarf variety of the woody. You know, so you got to check your label and make sure you're buying the tall plant, or it's never going to get tall. You know, I mean, it's so true because, I mean, I think of in annuals, there is bedding, azuratum. Then there's cutting right. azuratum. There's very bedding, different plants. bedding zinnias. And then there's our zinnias. And right. so heartbreaking and so much money wasted when you're talking about perennials, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think that's probably one of the things that um, people learn how to avoid those kind of costly mistakes from you. Yeah. I mean, that's, I was, was going to say that most of the new perennials coming out onto the market from new breeding programs they keep making them shorter and stockier. Like there's a yarrow, looks just like the coronation gold that grows to be 36 inches tall, but it's only 12 inches tall. The flower looks the same. So you got to make sure you're buying the tall variety, not the little short one.
because let's talk about the home gardener. They don't want stuff that's so tall that has to be supported. They're not cutting it. They want it for their, I mean, the number one complaint that I had as a home gardener was that everything got taller than the label said it did. You know, right. you go to the you go to the, the the nursery to buy stuff for your landscape, and then it outgrows itself in two years. It outgrows what it ever said it was mature height was, and so yeah. So the the landscape folks or the hybridizers and the breeders are really trying hard because that's the biggest market. Let's face it. So it's landscape, right? Home gardener and landscape. So they're making shorter and shorter with those flocks, yarrow. They're all shorter, stockier plants. So beautiful plants, but not geared toward cut power production. So you really have to be a super sleuth. Yes. <laughs> For sure. All right. And so here's one that I think that, um, you know, I'm kind of spoiled where we live. We get a lot of rain. Um, so Dave's number four is not thinking about how you're going to water and have any watering system, either whatever you're going to do in mind when you plant a bunch of perennials. Yeah. Um, I've had people before who thought they could plant a perennial patch five miles down the road on another piece of property where there is no water, no irrigation, no well, because they're perennials, they don't need water. And that's the worst thing you can do is so then you have this beautiful perennial coming up, you get a dry spring and all of a sudden that peony, the buds are gonna abort, they're not gonna bloom, they're gonna be struggling. The yarrow is just gonna be short and stunted. They're not gonna grow to the full potential because they've had no water. If you have it a dry spring or, or no snow and rain over the winter, and that happens somewhere every year. Someone's got a dry winter, a dry spring, and it's just gonna affect the crop. Um, and then the other thing is with perennials is you may have picked that plant in May or June, but you need to keep it happy and healthy the rest of the year so it comes back nice and big and bigger and better the following year. So if you have a dry summer, no rain in July and August, you still need to go out and water those perennials to get them to regenerate and come back the following year. So. And isn't there a lot of choice? There's a lot of different choices for irrigation. And, you know, my recommendation has always been, because I get a lot of questions about irrigation, is that you build a relationship with an irrigation supplier and they help you figure it out, right? I mean, right. you say I'm doing annuals or I'm doing perennials or I'm doing woodies and this is the type of soil that I have and this is how long my beds are. And they help you figure that out. You don't have to figure it out all by yourself. Right. But you definitely, in my opinion, you do need to have some kind of irrigation on your perennials. Otherwise, yeah. you're just going to shortchange yourself. It might not happen this year or next year, but the third year from now, you might get very little production because you had no rain. And that's when you feel like you're really going to be coming in to the best production. Right. Yep. So that's so very, very true. All right. So you got to make water preparations. I think number five is the biggest myth buster that I just can't wait for us to bust. Um, is that perennials really aren't nearly as much work as planting annuals. Um, right. <laughs> that they're carefree, that they aren't as much work. So let's just talk about how you take care of perennials. Well, there might be some that are easier to take care of, but they still need work. Um, whether it's your mountain mint that kind of grows all on its own, you still have to clean it up at the end of the year. If not, you can have these stalks in next year's flowers in the way. Um, a peony, it's you don't have to do much for it other than keep out the weeds and keep it water, but still have to clean up the plants at the end of the year. Um, lots of perennial sheet. There's some kind of maintenance throughout the season that you have to do. Um, so it, it's not like carefree, plant it and I'll come back later. You know, I'll check them once a week and pick them when they're ready in July. That doesn't work. You, you do need to keep them weeded, keep them watered, maintain them, clean them up at the end of the year. So it's not that they're less of work than annual. So it's a different kind of work. And, you know, I mean, People, you cannot underestimate what weeding chores are for a perennial field. It's right. handwork. I mean, that yeah, is. I'll, I'll confess, I one time had a patch of, peony, of perennials, and rather than try and weed them and clean them up, I just mowed it down and started over because it yeah. just, you know, planted it one year and they got weeds got out of control. It wasn't a big patch. The weeds got out of control, and it's like they weren't valuable plants. So I just, rather than trying to move them, I just gave up on them. And, and I think over. that happens a lot, Dave. And, you know, for like for landscape fabric, for those of us that live in the South, which means that we have a longer growing season, we typically, I mean, where I am, we get a lot of rain um, and a lot of heat and humidity, which just means that those perennial weeds 
are as persistent as those perennial flowers that flowers, we have. Yes. <laughs> and you know to to wrestle those i mean i i will confess the very same thing i totally had to use a tractor to rip the landscape fabric out and we just mowed and let those plants go we never saw them again yeah <laughs> i mean that is the reality and that's where I feel like people set themselves up for failure because they assume because they plan it once and then there's little care. In fact, it's as much care just doing it really differently, which makes me also want to say, don't perennials have to be most perennials, not all of them like peonies typically have to be lifted and split every three to five years to keep them invigorated to keep producing, right? Right. Some perennials do get too crowded over time, and you should dig them up and divide them. Other ones, actually, when you harvest them all the time, it could uh, reduce them and kill them out after a while. So every perennial yeah, is a little yeah. bit different. Yeah, you can't put one brush stroke and paint them all the same. So some are going to get bigger and better, some need to divide it, and some are just going to fizzle out after a while. So each crop is a little bit different. Do you know that I'm just sitting here remembering, I think it was in Vancouver too, we had a conference by a man, I cannot remember his whole name, his first name was Paul, and he was a big perennial grower, and he was sharing with us at this conference videos of some attachment that he was working on to help them lift and divide perennials, because it was an enormous task. For them to keep the, I mean, they found that lifting and dividing is what kept their perennials producing the top right. quality and the most abundance. But yet think about even having a half acre of perennials. I mean, even if you kind of succession lifted, you know what I mean? Having sections you do every right. year, that is a lot of dead gum work. And so I'm not saying it's not worth it. I'm saying Folks, perennials are as much work as annuals, but yet they bloom typically for a shorter period of time right. and they need real estate year round, right? Yep. You usually get flowers out of perennial only for two or three weeks and they're done because you've picked them all and they're gone and they don't rebloom. But they have to be weeded. They got to be weeded. But they're, all the time. <laughs> but if you sell them, you can still make good money off of them. That's true. And so the other thing that Dave was sharing, this is an add on, we're not making it number six, um, but it's like our closing tip is that Dave said, how many, you shouldn't buy five of a bunch of different ones. You should buy 25 of just a couple. Talk to us about Correct. that. Right. I've seen farms before where they had a whole bunch of different perennials and they plant just four or five of each. And that's fine if you're just trying to see if it's going to survive in your zone or if you like the plant but it's not enough to give you cut flower production. You want to start with at least 25 per plant, as much as 100 or more if you're a decent sized farm. And the other thing is you don't want to start out planting 25 or 30 perennials the first year you're planting perennials. Because you get lost in it, you won't take good care of them, the weeds are going to take over and you end up losing most of them. Stick That's with two or, three, two or three a year, grow those well, add a couple more every year. But always make peonies the first one you start with because that's the most important perennial out there. And I think that is one of the things that your course really has helped people to navigate all of that. It's like, which three do you pick? You know, what are the most beneficial? And, um, you know, so Dave, I really think that it's really um, an eye-opening thing for folks to hear. You know, we can't do super deep dives on everything as we have done in the past. You know, you and I have talked snaps and lisianthus and peonies and their own individual um, podcasts to kind of help people um, see like the big picture. But there's a big picture for almost every variety, for everything that we do, for everything that we grow. And when you become a commercial farmer, hallelujah, that's what our job is to learn more about all the different flowers, right? I mean, that's what gets us into this gig. Um, so what else did we have we not um, touched on about perennials that kind of are something that people don't realize or they don't know or understand? Well, I think one thing to remember is every peony is a little bit, every perennial is a little bit different as far as harvest stage. Some you let bloom, some you don't, some you can sell as a bud. You like the sedum, you can sell when it's green and sell when it's flowering. Um, you know, sedum, autumn joy, you can harvest that for 12 weeks almost. 
Um, whereas other perennials, sometimes it's, you know, three weeks and it's done. Um, but every perennial has a slightly different harvest stage of when you should pick it. Um, so that's just some that you learn by doing. And there's also the ASAFG uh, harvest book that right. basically tells you the harvest stage of all the different cut flowers. And you know that what we've learned, um, we have the native goldenrod that's here on our farm. It took me years to get it here. You know, it wasn't because I'm in the middle of the city, but we finally got some and now we have a lot of it. And, you know, because I had a lot of it, I was willing several years ago to experiment and we start we started cutting it long before it bloomed. As soon as the right. head was big enough to make an impact in a bouquet, do you want to know what has resulted from that? We cut every stem of Solidago before it goldenrod on our farm before it ever shows the first light of yellow. Mm -hmm. It is yep. the longest lasting, most beautiful color green. I mean, we could sold, I could have sold it commercially, but we didn't ever want to share it. It was our bouquet makers adored it for bouquets, you know? I mean, so that's one, but we still only get three weeks out of it, but it doesn't happen to be the three weeks of when it's actually blooming. Right. So, yep. Thank you. I forgot. I haven't grown autumn. Autumn joy is definitely a, de a good keeper and easy to propagate yourself too, right? Yes. Yep. Um, Very easy. So Dave, thanks so much for kind of giving us this look at perennials and hopefully it just gives people food for thought, you know? And, you know, as always people, I say, we each have to evaluate our own market we're selling into, what our environment is, what space we have. You have to find your own mix of what you grow and learning about all of them is how we do that. And um, Dave, I thank you for sharing so much of your knowledge with us in all areas from selling them to growing them and everything else in between. Um, glad to join you. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here again. So friends, again, thegardenersworkshop.com is a clearinghouse of all kinds of all things flowers. Whether you want to grow them for the home, start a business, run a business based on flowers, but maybe not grow them, we connect you with how you can do all of that. So friends, Till we meet again, and I will put a link down below for Dave's course, which registers typically in mid-June, and you don't want to miss the opportunity um, to like get in this guy's family, which is what happens when you take our big school courses. You're kind of connected to your instructor forever. Um, so thanks, Dave. Till we meet again, friends. Ciao. Bye-bye.